Hello, my name is uh, Dr. David Furlong. Um, I'm welcoming you to this Spirit Release Forum Conference, uh, which is given in February 2017. The video presentations, which are the various talks given at the conference, uh, and these were exploring different issues of spirit attachment, spirit release. The theme of the conference was spirit influence on mental health. Is spirit intrusion an important overlooked factor in hallucinatory disorders? Uh, I do hope you enjoy uh, the conference and all that it is uh, covered here, as there were some fascinating talks given. Anyway, yes. This is a question to Mike, first of all, but also to all of you. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if some patients who were diagnosed as schiz with schizophrenia, if they actually had mediumistic qualities, or that the perceptions of that, or if there is a continuum actually in those qualities, and how would you meet that? Some people do have mediumistic uh, qualities, but they don't know it. And so sometimes it's um, easier to help them to understand what's going on around in their own head. Um, and it's not always interference. It may well be that they're just uh, um, not in control of what they're getting. So by taking them to a development circle, we can teach them to control what they're getting. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it's just interestingly, I mean, I'm working with someone at the moment who um, has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, and they are very mediumistic and very open and picking up spirits and also made a connection with one or two uh, specific spirits. So um, part of the process is how you help them, uh, one, disconnect from those which are at the moment they've built up some form of link with uh, and to establish a whole new perception of what they can do and then how they can begin to control their, their mediumistic abilities. Um, and that's again part of a, a process and requires discipline uh, on behalf of these in this particular individual but again in other cases I had something similar people can be very open psychically and pick up spirits and not be aware that, that that's what's actually going on do you want to add anything what was the question um, about <laughs> uh, picking up spirits uh, are you in <laughs> schizophrenia <laughs> I, I am not a therapist, so I have little experience in this. But I had a number of sittings with one excellent medium in the 70s, that was one Hafsten Bjornsson. And uh, I attended many sittings just to record them. And I recall that it happened, they came sitters, I remember particularly one, and he complained about there was a spirit sort of nagging on him behind and he wanted somehow to get uh, rid of him but uh, how that went uh, I really don't know so I'm afraid I don't have much to say on this. Yes. Hi, I'm Mrs. Fertoff and I'm a Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, Dr. Furlong, um, I was wondering in regards to past lives, um, if, so if someone can remember all these things and they have, you know, the images, the feelings, they know details of this past life, couldn't it just be a spirit? Because if a spirit carries feelings, emotions, and all these things, um, can't they inhabit a life being and kind of like download that information? So can't like past lives be confused with that? 
I'm not like a skeptic towards it, but it's just also like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think all of that is possible, um, particularly before a person's begun to sort out what's actually going on in their inner world. And that's, <clears throat> you know, that's why I try to work with a person by helping them connect to their higher self, because their higher self has all of that insight. And if there is, uh, you know, if they've been presented with images, you can ask the higher self, can we identify the source of this? Um, in, in actual practice, um, if it's a past life per to, part of the person, or um, uh, is an actual separate spirit, um, the process of releasing it is probably not too different. I would try to help that whatever we've connected to, to be aware of its inner light, its connection to the higher self, and then asking for spirit guides and so forth to help it um, then move on. And if it's part of the personality, it goes back to the, to the higher self. If it's a separate spirit, it will go back, back into the, um, the spirit world, which uh, uh, Mike was talking about. So, um, it, it, you know, this, it is a, a gray area when you're looking at trying to separate out what's going on. But the higher self, if you get a clear connection with the higher self, the higher self has chapter and verse about what's going on within, it, within the person. And that, as a source of reference, can begin to sort out, is this a part of a person or not? And sometimes this takes time. I mean, you might think it's part of the self. In fact, uh, there's someone here I, I, that I've worked with who um, initially thought that what they had connected to was an aspect of themselves. But actually, coming out of it, it then transfer, tra transpired that it was a separate um, uh, spirit. So we, we then had to approach the thing from a slightly different perspective. But it, you know, it, it's a journey, uh, and you can begin to clear that up. So be open, be flexible. Uh, I know Mike doesn't believe in past lives. He would have it all. You want, might want to say something on yeah, this, Mike. Want to say something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the difference between David and I is that if that was a situation that I came across, I would be aware of the spirit as opposed to sort of looking at the person. Because my first instance is the person's got a problem. Is it spirit that's causing it? So I'll be sensing whether it's a spirit or not first. And then I would deal with it accordingly. If it was a sort of... Um, a separate spirit, then I would help them. And if it wasn't a separate spirit, then I would just pass them over to David. <laughs> Did you have one? Yeah, I guess it's similar in that I've, I've done, I've done sort of very similar work in a way to you, just to find the difficulty. But when you're working with sub personalities, um, I was just wondering, like, I, have, um, I haven't read your book yet, but uh, the question was really whether really these, as because you're working with that person's inner world, how much of the, the sort of darker elements are maybe their shadow as opposed to an external spirit, just uh, sort of, kind of part of them, their inner world. Yeah, uh, I, I, and that's absolutely... Uh, valid. I mean, it would be untrue to say just because a person's feeling angry that they have some malign spirit in it, because that's not true. I mean, uh, you can get traumatized uh, child parts which um, hold different emotions, and whether you want to see it as a, as a separate character, which is what I, how I see it, um, or whether you just see it as some emotional uh, bag of energy, uh, which which can be done, it doesn't really matter. But but we have to deal with these polarities inside of ourselves. That's part of our journey. How do we understand, uh, you know, the light shadow parts of ourselves? Uh, and just because these elements are there doesn't mean to say that there is a malign or dark spirit uh, attached. It's just that if there is, and there is that vulnerability which has come in, um, then it makes the process considerably more complex from my, my perspective. Uh, because it's understanding then what's what's gone on, but uh, you know the, the, the traumatized child parts of us uh, generally need a lot of love and support. And what I would do is ask uh, the client in their mind to just imagine, you know, if there's a child part, they're sitting there putting their arm around the child, communicating the child, tell the child it's going to be fine, it no longer needs to be stuck. You know, there's all sorts of places where child parts get locked away, put in cupboards, stuck down in the cellar. 
uh, ejected, you know, they can be in very disturbed space. They're conscious in a, in a way that, uh, like a spirit is conscious from my perspective, um, but in a limited consciousness. They're caught up in the trauma of what they're going through. And so when you connect to that part, you can begin to release some of the energy of that. The, the person can feel the emotion of what the child's carrying. And then you begin to bring the child into a place of healing. You ask for, for it to be aware of its inner light, the, the power of the higher self to come forth to assist it. And then it can either be reintegrated back within the psyche in, a, in an ordinary way or can be released in some cases. Broadly speaking, I used to say past life subpersonality parts would go back to the higher self uh, and uh, subpersonality parts from the current life would get reintegrated w within to the current life. But that's not a hard and fast rule because as I shared with you the experience of working with this uh, uh, client yesterday, it was very important because of the trauma in that child part, it went straight back to the higher self for support and help. And in other cases I've worked with clients where uh, a past life subpersonality part or past life that um, stuff needs to be reintegrated back within the current life. So it's a journey. I mean, you can never, it's not hard and fast. You're working with the clients in a world and it's an exploration into that inner world. And, and the, the signposts are the connections you can establish with that higher self part. Uh, because that can provide the guidance as to where you go, things you deal with, the stages you deal with them. Do you want to? Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, well, as I told you, I, I have not been much involved in therapy, but I have um, investigated a great number of cases of children who claim to remember a past life, almost a hundred of them. And then also, um, I made a psychological study of them. And then I found out, through these tests and interviews with the mother, that uh, they have uh, more problems than uh, children on the whole tend to have and they had signs of post-traumatic stress disorder but uh, on a closer examination i couldn't find any reason for this uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in the present life they seem to be well treated by their families and so on but uh, there was one thing, and that was that uh, most of them remembered a, a, a life in which they died violently by accidents or some other violent ways. And it seemed that uh, they spent quite a time ruminating, thinking about these uh, memories, and I uh, sort of have assumed that their post-traumatic stress disorder came from this different, difficult reliving of what had happened to them in the previous life. Um, so, uh, yeah. But then I also state, made a study where I took a sample of um, uh, subjects uh, whom uh, Ian Stevenson had investigated uh, long before me, and then I interviewed them as uh, grown-up persons. And it seems that in the long run, they had recovered from these uh, traumatic experiences, and they were living, uh, leading a... a, a uh, a, a fine life, no, no case of mental disturbances that I was aware of, and uh, so they were, they were quite successful. And then also one thing about these children who remember past life, they used to do very well in school. They had that at an early age, uh, a greater knowledge of words than uh, than uh, children in general have, so it seems that they brought with them also some some good things. They were often doing very well in school, and um, and were quite efficient in many ways. I've got about four or five, so... <coughs> um, I just wanted to ask all of you, really, about... Um, I asked you earlier, David, about a, a, a dead grandmother 
who's hanging around. And you mentioned her higher self. So can you? I didn't really ever know that the, that the dead were not integrated with their higher self. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the higher self of, of the dead. Um, uh, uh, okay, just, just picking up. Uh, again, I'm presenting it from my perspective, from my understanding. Um, <clears throat> Mike has something slightly different. He talks about the, uh, the spirit world and the spirit well realm. Um, the way I would see it is that part of our spirit is in the spirit world, continuously there. Um, and it's, it has a sense of connection with us, um, and that's the link which I would call the higher self connection. Um, but once we're here in the physical body, we're experiencing in the physical. Now, when my, I no longer have a physical body, my soul part steps out of me and is separate. And it could be just hanging around in the spirit realm. I, I would hope it would have more sense, but uh, <laughs> who knows? I mean, you know, we, we never know quite how we're going to uh, move on. Um, but there's still, of course, there's the link through to the higher self. But the higher self may not be able to communicate with it. I mean, after all, if the higher self could easily communicate with all its bits, they, they would automatically go straight back up. But because, as, as Mike has talked about, and I would emphatically agree, um, the, the free will of the part which is stuck is still a free will. The higher self will no, not override that. And so the, 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 that free will part has to wake up to what's gone on for it in order for it to either find someone like Mike who can say, hey, you know, who you can um, move back into the spirit world or um, ultimately wakes up on its own volition, begins to recognize something's wrong and maybe then opens up to, to begin to think about um, uh, moving back into to the spirit world. But once it starts to have a desire to want to move back, then obviously support and loved ones can come forward and communicate with it. Um, that's the way I would um, understand that. I mean, you, I don't know how whether you would pretty see. Pretty well covered it. <laughs> mm. He's pretty well covered it. So basically, so once the, once the, 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 that um, once the spirit wow, wants to go back, realized, it then becomes reintegrated with its higher self, and it becomes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 your higher self takes back all of that spiritual knowledge, uh, and it's all reabsorbed back within itself. Um, uh, and, and so it becomes part of a greater whole. Uh, and then it's, from my understanding, obviously you might maybe see it slightly differently, but from my understanding, from that place, it then decides, well, we're going to have another life. This is what things we're going to sort out. I mean, I've had senses of working with clients who've incarnated specifically to heal past life parts of them which are stuck. So think about that. Um, anyway, Mike, you want to share? What I wanted to say was that even though you've passed over, you still have your guides around you until you get back to what I call the spirit world. So they're there even if you don't see them. And it's only because you're focused on the physical world that you don't see them. Because if you um, realise that spirit don't see with eyes, but they use their senses, that's how they see in spirit. Because you're used to using your physical eyes, you don't think about that. But um, once you've realised and your guides have got through to you, then you go straight back to spirit. Back, yeah. um, I suspect this question's for David, but I'm very happy anyone answer it. You mentioned contracts, and so contracts and agreements, do you think they're actually real, or do you think they're a belief system? And if an attached entity is saying, I have a contract with the person, is it really real? Because contracts can be broken, and contracts themselves sound so final. Uh, yeah. So, if you have some examples of a contract that's absolute. Um, well, again, part of all of this uh, has just come out of the experience of working with people in, in their, their inner worlds. And when you, you, uh, you start to connect with some, uh, let's say, slightly grey or darker being, and they say, I got a contract, and you're, here's, you know, this person signed up for this deal. Um, and, and the way, unfortunately, dark beings operate is they would try to make out that once you've signed on the dotted line, that's it, you know, you can't break the contract. I mean, it's, it's nonsense uh, because all contracts, I mean, the only true contract in my understanding we have is to our inner soul essence and our higher self um, and to that evolution of, of the light which is within us. But obviously the, the, those that want to keep us stuck and trapped are going to try and um, established ways of keeping a control 
Um, and because of free will, um, he, that free will is part of cosmic principle. Now, dark spirit cannot come into me unless at some level, through my free will, I've acquiesced to that process. And there could be different reasons. I mean, if you read Tom Zinzer's book, he, he gives some accounts as to what's, what's uh, going on. But, I mean, the case I was working with um, yesterday, uh, like, I mean, clearly what happened is that at some point in this person's psyche, he had been given some information. Uh, and you're given this information on the basis that you are, uh, you are signing up to a contract, a demon, uh, an agreement, so, like the symbols of the Black Book. You know, this is, and what this individual was actually saying. Well, you know, to start with, uh, I was getting some form of knowledge and understanding, but then I realized it was a trap. I was hooked, but because I felt I'd signed up to a contract, I didn't think I could break it. Um, but this is, this is a distortion. All contracts can be dissolved. Um, you can ask your higher self and the higher beings of light to, to nullify those contracts. Um, but I don't think you deal with contracts quite in that form, do you, Mike? Yeah, I do, actually. All right. Sometimes people have a contract with a spirit to put a curse on other people. And you are what you believe. You have free will. If you don't want to, say no. Simple. There are belief systems, of course, that people have. You know, like, I, I must please my mother or else, or I can't really express myself because my mind will get attacked. And those sort of go on at unconscious levels, but um, that's the kind of work that any counsellor or therapist will come across. Well, I've been doing past lives for a couple of decades, and never once does someone say I have a contract. Hmm. I, hear, I see it written, I hear other people talk about it, but they never say, oh, I have a contract with so-and-so. Uh, did you have one? You still want to have a question? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a couple of points that were mentioned. The first thing is the gentleman behind me asked Mike about um, schizophrenia and ME. I suffer from ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, so I'm aware of um, the diagno diagnostic process and so on. ME is classified by the World Health <coughs> Organization at G93.3 as a physical neurological disease. So that is quite clear, and as a result of that, you will not find uh, ME, or uh, one of its namesakes, chronic fatigue syndrome or post-viral fatigue syndrome, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. So that is because you're dealing with a physical disease on the one hand, and schizophrenia, which is obviously a mental health condition, and mental health conditions are uh, formally known as mental disorders, disorders because they're not thought to have a physical causation. Doctors, of course, can make mistakes when they, when they diagnose patients. And sometimes patients who have mental health conditions, um, because of the stigma around mental health conditions, often will say, but not always, often will say that they suffer from a condition like ME that is more acceptable uh, in, to the public in general terms. Uh, but uh, the question I would really like to ask the panel is this. this the lady in front of me here and to, to uh, my right inquired about uh, poltergeist, poltergeist agents and the theory of sort of causation uh, in terms of you know, energies running around during puberty. Like Mike, um, I uh, was on a holiday in a very haunted house and there was a poltergeist there that was witnessed by my family and all the members of another family. So a poltergeist that was actually visible uh, and moved objects and so on and so forth. But it appears on the face of it to break the rules. Yet, myself and another girl would, according to this theory, um, be the poltergeist agents and responsible rather than a ghost or spirit. Um, I have tried to get my head around both ways of seeing this. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on this matter? As I said earlier, a poltergeist is just a spirit. They get attracted to people in their teens because of the change in emotions as the people go through puberty. And that they, they're up and down all over the place, so they're easy to manipulate. But it's still a spirit that's doing it. Um, and the energy supplied by the, the youth, if you like, the, the teenager that's going through the problem of changing their emotions, they supply the energy and the spirit is attracted by that because they've got someone to play with. Once you've got rid of the spirit, then the child should settle down. 
Um, yeah, I think I would, I would broadly absolutely concur with that. Um, the, 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 the sun energy gets released in puberty um, before it gets fully balanced out. And obviously it's connected, in, so obviously it would appear to be connected into the, to the sexual development side of uh, the, the psyche. Uh, and it's that energy which I think gets uh, used by the spirits to, to create the, the sort of poltergeist phenomena. I mean, poltergeist literally means noisy spirit. Um, but, you know, people can see plates flying around the room, all sorts of other uh, type of phenomena of that, that type. Um, and and it's, it's obviously having to draw energy at some level, the spirit is. Uh, and I think sees a ready source in, in, um, in pubescence, uh, you know, the, the, that sort of period of time. Um, but uh, of course, psychic phenomena uh, could occur at, at other times, and uh, you know, where medium, people who've been in mediumistic circles will often see um, all sorts of strange things occurring and um, objects moving. So it, it, it's an energy which I think a spirit can use, which is connected into human beings, which can then generate these phenomena. I don't really have an answer. Hi, um, this is a question for both Mike and David. Um, have either of you had any experience of dealing with children? Um, and if so, um, how have you dealt with communicating the recognition of a dark force or spirit associated with them? Um, and in addition to that, are you regulated by any external bodies that kind of have the same time in the world? Yeah, I dealt with a little chap. I thought I got a message. <laughs> <laughs> Some medium I am. <laughs> yeah, about uh, three months ago, we dealt with a child of about four who was um, having a nasty man in his bedroom telling him to get out. So what we did, we just said to the man, we said to the little boy, we're going to take the man with us because he's lost. So um, we just removed the the man from the bedroom and as far as the little boy was concerned he was gone so he was happy and then we dealt with the man the spirit um, afterwards so we didn't sort of expose the child to any sort of mumbo jumbo <laughs> um, yeah, yeah in a broadly similar way to, to Mike I, I would be very wary of think of working um, interactively uh, with a child I mean um, I can think of one or two cases uh, of a child who, uh, who was very, being uh, diagnosed as um, terminally ill and a very short time to, to live, and so I was able to work with that child um, to, to begin to help it on its transitional journey, but with the parents obviously uh, fully present and in, in the right sort of way. I think when you're dealing with things which are frightening for children, you have to be very, very aware, and like Mike, um, you know, I would simply say, okay, well, we're going in to, to, to bless this house or clear out whatever's uh, there. Because in, generally what happens is the parents say, oh, my child's got some, uh, feels there's something in the bedroom, you know, can you come and clear and sort out this space? Which is, um, what I would do is clear the energy of the house and then generally the problem is, is fine. It's not, not then an issue. But I think working interactively with, with children, um, I think one has to be, would have to be very, circumspect about how that's done uh, and to do it in, in a very um, boundaried way. Um, I don't know if you've got it, I mean you've got some experience of working with children, haven't you David? Yes, yes, yes I, I do work as a child psychiatrist um, uh, most of my time actually and um, <clears throat> I have um, a number of uh, colleagues who uh, provide therapy with children. So children often find that they're best helped by some creative therapy rather than talking therapy. It's a much more acceptable medium to be working in with, with children. Um, I'll say a bit more about it later on this afternoon, uh, working with adolescents where there may be spirit interference and how one might manage that. Did you have a question still? It's just uh, that uh, I, I felt uh, a little um, um, uh, lacking information uh, when the word was brought up about contracts um, because in, in, the, in the spiritual side of things and I come from a fairly spiritual background uh, and have done some work in deliverance teams 
and uh, a contract is, uh, in the word itself, drawn out together, whereas a convene or convention is brought together by uh, agreement. Uh, so a contract is negative, whereas a convention or convening is uh, promissory. And uh, this is a very high point in the spiritual realm where there is the thought that um, a spirit might be holding on to the free will of the client. And in fact, uh, they are under contract, and it has been seen in uh, various uh, um, exorcisms where a spirit spoke up and said, do you not know that I don't want to sit in this bloody body? I am under contract to do so. So somewhere along the line, it had to be taken into account that there was a hierarchy of spirit and the one ruling the other at various lower levels. And in Kabbalah, of course, this goes right down past where we are at the moment into the reverse of the hierarchy of heaven. So we, um, when you cross that line into the spiritual, all sorts of other conditions come up. And, um, if one wouldn't, this is addressed to Michael, one wouldn't necessarily pussyfoot around with uh, an evil entity once it was recognized. <coughs> Well, I do agree with what you say about the hierarchy. As far as pussyfooting around with the Nazis, um, we're not going to let them get away with it, are we? No. And the white's stronger than the dark, and we work together, right, whereas they work individually. So at the end of the day, we're going to win. We don't walk away just because they're nasty. It's in that respect, the contract is a curse. Yeah. It's a promissory blessing. As we've said, contracts can be broken. Yeah, uh, I, I would I would concur really with what you say, uh, and I would also see there is a high because very often you connect to some dark spirit, and then when you start to communicate with it, I mean I would always try to help them. You know, if I establish a sense and I feel there's a dark energy is attached to a person, we've identified it. I would then communicate with it. What's going on? Can we help you? You remember there is a light within you, and then it will say, I'm frightened. Someone else is going to control me. I'm going to be punished. So you recognize there's another spirit which is behind it, which is trying to control it and make it do what it needs to do. So, so I'm aware of your client, of course, who's suffering all this. Well, you know, one's trying to help, obviously, clear up all of this, uh, you know, this, this channel and so forth. Ultimately, of course, one would like to see the whole world redeemed. But there is some dark energies, there are some dark spirits around that are trying to... Uh, manipulate and they have a hierarchy but their hierarchy instead of being based upon free will is based upon control um, you can always tell the presence of dark spirits by three simple things fear uh, is one uh, the inhibition of the free will uh, is another and the inflation of the ego is the third so if you have see those present in any way then you know that there is something malign or dark is going to be working through them. Thank you. Can you repeat those three? Uh, right, the three. Look out for the fear. Actually, I mean, it's, it's, you can apply this right across politicians, the whole gamut of life. But, um, you know, when the fear is jacked up, you can be sure that there is some form of dark energy is working through it, some form of the shadow is working through it. Uh, uh, inhibition of free will, control, in other words. You've got to do what we tell you. You know, this is the only way. If you do it, you're going to be, don't do it, you're going to be punished. That sort of thing. And the inflation of the ego. Very subtle, you know. We're the master race type idea. Um, you know, we are very clever. We are so forth. All of that inflation um, is to, to, to watch out for. Um, and as you say, you can see this coming out, you know, politicians all across the board. <laughs> Yeah. One, one last quick question from somebody who hasn't already asked. Yes. Uh, my, my question is, I wonder when you work with clients, to what extent do you investigate their prior medical history? Are you obtaining their medical records and also details of any medication that they happen to be taking or have taken in the past? Uh, uh, well, speaking from my own point of view, um, I would take, uh, obviously, a, a, a brief medical um, check on what's going on. I don't ask for their doctor's records. I'm working with the client, the person that sat there. Um, 
and they will usually present what the issues are and I can only be open to what they're actually sharing with me. Obviously they're coming, they're paying for my time uh, in this, this, this basis, but I will try to gather all relevant information as far as I can in order to begin to help them on the journey. But the, the real key part is how can I help them communicate with their higher wisdom in order to begin to transform what's going on for them. From my part, um, most of the people that I go to see don't want the doctor to know anyway. <laughs> so when I sit down and have a chat with him, I find out what the problem is and deal with the problem accordingly. Um, if it's a medical problem, then I do advise them to go and see the doctor. If it's a spiritual problem, then I sort it out. Yeah. Well, you want to say anything? No. No. Thank you very much, panel, and thank you for your questions. Um, you have just about 58 minutes for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a contract! Thank you.